Today, we're going to finish our discussion on limits and continuity. But before we do so, let's review some ideas from last time. First, I'd like to remind you about the definition of a level set. Let's consider a function f from a subset A inside of Rn to a subset B sitting inside of Rm. For each fixed vector C inside of our codomain B, we'll define the level set as the collection of vectors x in the domain A, such that f of x equals this fixed vector C. When n is equal to 2, this is a level curve. And when n is equal to 3, this is a level surface. Let's next, let's review the definition of an open ball. An open ball of radius r centered at a point x0 is just the collection of points x, which are less than a distance r away from this center x0. When n is equal to 1, this is nothing more than the open interval from x0 minus r to x0 plus r. When n is equal to 2, this is a disk of radius r, but without boundary. And similarly, when n is equal to 3, this is a ball of radius r, but again, without boundary. Finally, let's review the ideas of an open set and the boundary of a set. We'll say that a subset u is open if, for every point x in u, we can find a radius r so that the open ball, dr of x, is completely contained inside of u. Conversely, let's pick a point x in Rn. Any open set u that contains this point x is called a neighborhood of the point x. Now say that capital A is some subset of Rn. We'll say that a vector x is a boundary point for A if, given any neighborhood u of this point x, part of the neighborhood lies inside of the set A and part lies outside of the set A. We'll denote the collection of boundary points as del of A. Here are some graphical examples of what we discussed before. These here are all examples of these open balls dr of x0. In figure A, you'll see what happens when n is equal to 1. Again, this is simply the open interval from x0 minus r to x0 plus r. When n is equal to 2, this is figure B, you see that we have a disk of radius r centered at x0, but here we have a dashed line because we don't want to include the boundary. And you can see a similar picture in figure C when n is equal to 3. Now what about this idea of an open set? Let's consider a collection u, as you see here on your screen. If we pick any point x0 inside of u, notice that we can choose a radius r small enough so that the darker shaded region of blue, that is dr of x0, is completely contained inside of our given set u. We can also consider a few examples of all of these ideas. We can consider a rectangular region, u, maybe where we have x lying between two, two endpoints, a and b, and y lying between two endpoints, c and d. If we do not include any of these endpoints, then we have an open set. Now, for this new set, capital A, what if we did include these endpoints? Now you can see that the boundary, that is del of A, really does look like what happens when you draw, allowed, draw around the boundary of the square. Either we'll have the top and bottom segments, that is either when y is equal to c and y is equal to d, or the left and right segments, this is either when a is equal to b or a is equal to c. This means that our set A is not really an open set because we do have to worry about the points here on the boundary, del of A, where remember, for any given neighborhood of something on the boundary, Part of it lies inside of A, and part of it lies outside. Here's a proposition. Say that we have a collection of open balls, D, R sub alpha, centered at a point X vector of alpha. Then the union of all of these balls is also an open set. In particular, every open ball is an example of an open set. What, on the other hand, if we have just a finite collection of these open balls? then the intersection of finitely many is also an open set. In particular, you'll notice that the empty set 
and the entire space Rn are both examples of open sets. Now let's move on to some new material for today, and I'd like to begin with a proposition. Just like before, say that we have two subsets, capital A inside of Rn, and capital B sitting inside of Rm. We'll assume for the moment that both of these are open sets. Let's say that we have a function f going from a to b. And for the moment, let's fix a vector a sitting inside of either our domain, capital A, or its boundary, del of a. Let's also fix a vector b, which may not necessarily be in the codomain, capital B, but we'll just say that it's some vector sitting inside of rm. Then the following two statements are equivalent. Number one, given a neighborhood n of our vector b, there exists a neighborhood u of our vector a, such that whenever f of x is contained inside of the neighborhood n, whenever we have f of x sits inside of the neighborhood n, whenever x sits inside of the neighborhood u. This is equivalent to saying, given a positive epsilon, there exists a positive delta such that the distance of f of x away from b is less than epsilon whenever the distance from x from a is less than delta. We'll show a picture of this in just a moment. But here's some definitions. If either of these statements is true, remember that these two statements are equivalent, then we'll say the limit as x approaches a of f of x equals b. Notice that we never said that b has to equal f of a. That's part of the next definition. We'll say that f is continuous on the set a if the limit as x approaches a of f of x equals f of a for every vector a in our set a. Here are a couple of pictures to try to exemplify these concepts. On the left, you'll see a function g that sends a real number x to x minus one divided by the square root of x minus one. We can plot out the graph of here on a calculator, but you'll notice that there's a problem when x equals one. That's why we have a small blue circle to denote that we don't quite know what the value is when x equals one. You can see that this function here should though have a limit as x approaches one. Maybe as we try to approach, we can fill in this little circle here with a blue dot, and this is exactly what you see on the right-hand graph. As x approaches one, we expect the function to tend to the value, the number two. Well, by kind of gluing together the parts here of this blue graph, we can actually fill in the circle on the left to find this blue dot on the right. That's what it means to be continuous. Maybe the function is not defined when x equals a, but continuous really says that we really should be able to fill in that circle and actually figure out exactly what the value is. That should be f of a instead. Here are a couple more examples. On the right, you see an example of a continuous function. As x gets closer to x zero, you can see that f of x gets very close to f of x zero. This is what it means to be continuous. On the left, however, you can see that as x approaches x zero, we find this open circle. That's what the value of the function should be. However, f of x zero is kind of the graph that's right above where it should be. That's the black dot, and that's the blue line that contains the function f. You'll see that on the left, this is an example of a function that is not continuous. The limit doesn't approach what we expect it to approach. Here's yet another example. Here, I'd like to discuss what cont continuity and discontinuity looks like if we're dealing with more than one variable. But the graphs here morally are the same as the graphs that we saw on the previous slides. You'll notice on the right that for every x zero, we have some value f of x zero, and the sheet that we have here seems to be continuous in the sense of no breaks or no cuts. On the other hand, if you take a look at the graph on the left, this is figure A, you'll see that there is a break in the surface. This means that the figure on the left is not continuous. Again, the concept of continuity says that there really shouldn't be any breaks here. 
Now, what exactly does this proposition state? It's a little bit awkward in that we're saying something about epsilons and deltas. So I'll try to give you a more intuitive explanation as follows. We can always consider a point x0, as you see on the left, and we can consider a neighborhood of x0, namely this disk d delta of x0, also on the left. That's the dotted blue line that you see. However, let's take a look at something similar on the right. On the right, we have a point B, and we'd like to take a look at the open disk that contains B. This is this D sub epsilon of B. Again, it's the dotted darker blue line you see on the right. What I'd like to happen is if you give me a small disk D sub epsilon of B, then I can choose my delta even smaller so that the image of the disk on the left is completely contained inside of the disk on the right. Again, the idea is that if you give me D sub epsilon of B on the right, I should be able to find a delta small enough so that when I take my function f and send that over to a small region inside of d sub epsilon of b, it should be completely contained inside of it. That's really what it means to be continuous. Now let's try to spend a little bit of time discussing why these two statements were equivalent. Let's do the first implies the second. First, let's say given a positive epsilon, We'll take a look at a neighborhood of our vector b. We'll call this d sub epsilon of the vector b. By assumption, we can find a neighborhood u of our vector a such that f of x is contained inside of the neighborhood n whenever the vector x is contained inside of the neighborhood u. Since u is an open set, this means for every point in u, we can find an open disk completely contained inside of u. In particular, given the point a vector, I can find a delta such that d sub delta of a vector is completely contained inside of u. However, if I stare at this, notice that whenever x is a distance less than delta away from a, that is, x minus a is less than delta, then x must be contained inside of u. However, we also know that f of x has to be contained inside of d sub epsilon of b. So by the definition of that disk, f of x minus b is less than epsilon. This proves that one implies two. Now, let's take a look at the opposite direction. Let's let n be any neighborhood of the vector b. Since n is open, I can find an open disk that contains b that's completely inside of n. In other words, there exists a positive epsilon since that d sub epsilon of b vector is completely contained inside of the neighborhood n. But by assumption, I can find a delta such that f of x minus b is less than epsilon whenever x minus a is less than delta. But remember that the set of vectors such that x minus a is less than delta is exactly the open disk d sub ep delta of a. So let's denote this d sub delta of a as a neighborhood of the vector a. But now staring at this, we really do see that if x is in the open neighborhood, is in the neighborhood u, then we must have f of x minus b is less than epsilon, so that f of x is contained inside of d sub epsilon of b vector. You'll see that it's almost the same proof because it's the same general concept. We have our open sets, d sub epsilon of b, d sub delta of a. We can think of these as the neighborhood n and the neighborhoods u, respectively. But either way, we've completed the proof. Let's now try to finish things up by discussing a possible example to really get some intuition behind, is there a different way we can determine when a function is continuous? Let's consider the example of those vectors in capital A that are different from the origin. Let's take a look at the function f of xy equals x times y divided by x squared plus y squared. Does the limit as xy approaches the origin of this function exist? We're going to show that the answer is no, the limit does not exist. Here's how we'll do this. 
Start with any point x0, y0 that is not the origin. And let's draw a straight line from this point to the origin. We'll denote this by a function gamma. Again, when t is equal to 0, gamma starts at the point x0, y0. As t approaches 1, gamma goes to the origin 0, 0. Now let's take a look at the composition f composed with gamma. In other words, whenever you see an x, substitute in 1 minus t times x0. And whenever you see a y, substitute in 1 minus t times y0. We notice that this composition gives us back a constant function. So for any t, we have a specific value, namely x0, y0, divided by x0 squared plus y0 squared. What's happening here is that once you fix a path gamma, your function f is constant on that path. But now here's the problem. If our function is constant on this path, and if the limit were to exist, then the value of the limit should just simply depend on the origin. It should just depend on the constant that doesn't really matter where we've started. But you'll see the problem here. This here really does depend on where we started. So the question is, which constant should it be? Well, this function f is really not a constant. So that means then this limit here cannot exist. That's our problem. Let's use this now to finish the lecture by discussing some properties of limits. Let's say that f and g are two functions, and let's say that maybe the limit as x approaches a of f of x equals b1, and the limit as x approaches a of g equals b2. First, we have the property of linearity. The linear combination of two continuous functions is also continuous. In other words, if you have the linear combination C1F plus C2G, then its limit as x approaches A is C1B1 plus C2B2. We have a similar property about products. That is, the product of two continuous functions is also continuous. In other words, the limit as x approaches A of F times G is simply B1 times B2. And finally, we have a property about composition. Let's say that the limit as y approaches b of g of y equals g of b, and we'll let b be the limit as x approaches a of f of x, which of course equals f of a. Then for the composition h, which is g composed f, its limit is g of f of a. In other words, the composition of two continuous functions is also a continuous function. Finally, we have this idea of path independence of limits. Remember the previous example we just worked through. Let's say that we have a function that is continuous at a point x equals a. Then for any continuous path where the limit of this path is our endpoint a, then the limit of the composition f composed gamma should be f of a. In other words, the limit here should be independent of the choice of path gamma. Remember in the previous example, our limit did not exist because we found a dependence on the choice of the path. So the path independence of limit says, as long as you have a continuous function f and a continuous path gamma, then the limit that we have here is independent of the choice of path. Let's try to sketch through the proofs of these statements. First, we'll show that linearity is true, so let's let epsilon be a positive given real number. Well, since we have limits for f going to be 1 and g going to be 2, then this means that we can find a delta 1 and a delta 2 so that the distance from f to b1 is less than some epsilon divided by some number, and the distance from g to b2 is epsilon divided by a similar number. Let's let delta be the smaller of delta 1 and delta 2. The intuition here is this. As long as x is at most delta away from a, 
we find a disk that's even smaller than the assumptions we had before about delta 1 and delta 2. So if x is delta away from a, then it's certainly less than being delta 1 away from a and less than being delta 2 away from a. That's why we chose the minimum. So we're very, very close to A is what this says. Now we simply do a little bit of algebra and we realize that C1F plus C2G, this linear combination, minus C1B1 plus C2B2, another linear combination, is at most epsilon away from each other. But this is exactly the same thing as saying that the limit of the linear combination is the linear combination of the limits. We find a similar proof if we do this for products. But we're going to move things around just a little bit, although it's the same concept of the proof. If epsilon is given, let's define epsilon 1 as the positive root of a certain quadratic equation. If we do this, similar to before, let's say that f is epsilon 1 away from b1 and g is epsilon away from b2. There is some delta 1 and delta 2, so we can force x to be close enough to a where this is the case. Well, let's choose a delta smaller than delta 1 and delta 2 so that x will be even closer to a than it was for delta 1 and delta 2. Then again, by using a little bit of algebra, we'll find that f times g is at most epsilon away from b1, b2. But of course, this is the same thing as saying that the limit of the product is the product of the limits. Finally, let's take a look at this concept of composition. Since we want to prove that it's true, let's let epsilon be given once again. Well, since g is continuous, we know that there exists an epsilon 1 since that g of y minus g of b is less than epsilon whenever y minus b is less than epsilon 1. The idea here is that if you want g of y minus g of b to be very small, then you have to choose y minus b to be even smaller. Now remember, we're going to pick b vector equals f of a vector, so we'll only consider those vectors y so that y equals f of x vector. In a similar way, since f is continuous, this means that there exists some positive delta so that f of x minus f of a is less than epsilon 1 whenever x minus a is less than delta. So now let's put all of this together. Since x minus a is less than delta, we know that f of x minus f of a is less than epsilon 1. This is what it means for f to be continuous. But now we know that since f of x minus f of a is less than epsilon 1, We'll substitute y equals f of x and b equals f of a to conclude that g of y minus g of b is less than epsilon. But this is equivalent to saying h of x minus h of a is less than epsilon. Remember, h is g composed with f. But finally, this is the same as saying that the limit of x approaches a of f of x equals g composed with f of a. That completes our proof. Thanks very much for watching.